Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cardiology Lectures. I am Dr. Nick Nicker. Today we are going to be talking about clinical EKG interpretation. This is an accompaniment to my clinical EKG interpretation book, which you can check it on Amazon.com. So let us begin. In this chapter on introduction, we are going to be talking about the introduction to electrocardiography electrical system of the heart, action potential, normal cardiac cycle, lead placement, electrical versus mechanical activation of the heart, EKG paper, voltage and time intervals, rate, rhythm and normal EKG, adrenergic and cholinergic effects on the heart and cardiovascular system. And we will conclude in this chapter with the electrical axis of the heart. Electrocardiogram is like a road map of your entire life. This EKG book in particular, the clinical EKG interpretation is written in such a simple language. It is useful to medical students, nurses, EMTs, ER physicians, anesthesiologists, and is also sophisticated enough for a cardiology fellow to learn enough to, to pass the EKG section of the cardiology boards. So let us continue with the presentation. As I told you, this is a key to your heart's secret. It can tell us about uh, the past, the present, and sometimes the future. This one electrocardiogram can tell us about your heart rate, your heart rhythm, any extra beats, strain. It can also tell us about cardiac enlargement, old or new myocardial infarctions, cardiac arrhythmias, and also electrocardiogram may be the first sign of a serious metabolic derangement going on in the body, such as hyperkalemia. So the electrocardiogram is an important bedside tool that can help us in identifying so many cardiac and non-cardiac uh, changes uh, happening inside the body. It begins with the electrical system of the heart. As you know, the heart beats around 60 to 80 beats per minute. What makes the heart beat at a constant rate from the time we are born until we take the last breath? The heart is controlled by a well-crafted electrical system that has so many features which we are going to cover you will be amazed. It has a specialized myoepithelial cells at the junction of the right atrium and the superior vena cava, and it is called the sinus node. Sinus node is the impulse generator. It automatically generates impulse every second, or I should say 60 to 80 times per minute, and then it transmits that impulse through these interatrial connections to the AV node, which is located at the junction of all the four chambers uh, in the crux area. So these fibers supply the atria and they activate the atria. And there's another branch called the Bachmann's bundle, which supplies uh, the left atrium. When the impulse travels from the sinus node through these interatrial connections to the AV node, the AV node acts like a delay and a relay station. AV node is built with such precision electrical intelligence that it delays the impulse coming from the atria before it is transmitted to the ventricles to allow the atria to mechanically contract and pump blood into the ventricles before the ventricles begin to act and contract. So that delay is an important uh, uh, point that we need to keep in mind and we'll be coming back to that in the future uh, presentations. Once the AV node transmits the impulse, it goes through the bundle of His. The bundle of His is a common bundle which divides into the right bundle and the left bundle. And these bundles uh, travel along the interventricular septum and through the, and through the lateral walls and give rise to a very rich network of Purkinje fibers, which goes through the interstitial space throughout the myocardium, and thus activating the ventricles. 
couple of things about this electrical system and how the heart muscle responds. When the impulse arrives from the sinus node, it activates the entire atrial musculature at one time. This is known as the all or none phenomenon. That is, if the impulse activates one cell in the atrial chambers, both the atria contract simultaneously or they are activated simultaneously. When the impulse travels through the right and left bundles, it activates both ventricles simultaneously so that both ventricles contract at the same time. So that is uh, the normal electrical system. So the sinus node is uh, supposed to generate the impulse and from there it, uh, the impulse is uh, traveling to the rest of the heart. But sinus node is not the only node that can generate an impulse. If the sinus node fails to generate an impulse, the atrial chamber itself can generate an electrical impulse, then propagate it through the AP node to the rest of the ventricles. Similarly, if the atria are not able to generate the impulse, the AB node has a spontaneous uh, activation capability, although the rate may be slower, but still it can activate the rest of the electrical system. And in a similar manner, the bundle of fists, the bundle branches, and even the ventricular muscle all have intrinsic uh, spontaneous depolarization capabilities if a certain heart rate is not reached by the impulse coming from the sinus node or the AB node. So with this background in the electrical system of the heart, let us continue on to some accessory pathways. In the previous slide, I talked about the normal electrical connections between the sinus node to the AV node and to the rest of the ventricles. But there are times when we can see abnormal electrical pathways in the wall of the left atrium or the right atrium. And these are called the accessory pathways. When these accessory pathways exist, the electrical impulse may not only be traveling through the normal pathways, it may also travel through the accessory pathways, thus creating an abnormality in the electrocardiogram as it is shown here. Because of the faster propagation of the impulse through the accessory pathway, we get the initial deflection, which is followed by the regular QRS complex uh, traveling through the normal conduction system, thus producing the delta wave, which is one of the hallmarks of WPW or Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Similarly, if we look through the, if we look through the free wall of the left atrium and the right atrium, we will notice there are certain extra channels that are located along these rings which can act as conduits for impulse transmission, thus resulting in cardiac arrhythmias or supraventricular tachycardias. The ones which are located along the tricuspid valve ring can be involved in atrial flutter tachyarrhythmia, and those involved in the lateral wall of uh, the left atrium may be involved with uh, tachyarrhythmias related to the wolf Parkinson White syndrome, which I talked about, and we'll also talk about uh, some other extra connections uh, as we uh, proceed further. Now, let's move on to action potential. We talked about the sinus node being able to spontaneously generate an impulse. How does a sinus node generate an impulse? The impulse which we are going to look at is known as the action potential. The action potential which I'm going to talk about initially is, re is related to the atrial or ventricular muscle because uh, it is waiting for a signal to trigger this action potential. Before the muscle can contract, it has to get the electrical stimulation from some source. So take for example, the atria or the ventricular muscle gets its impulse through the conduction system from the SA node. When the SA node generates an impulse spontaneously that is transmitted to the atrial muscle level, 
where in it generates an action potential. This is a representation of an action potential. Let's assume that we are looking into the action potential of atrial myocyte. At rest inside the cell, it is minus 90 millivolts and it has a resting membrane potential which is depicted by phase 4. As soon as the impulse arrives at this juncture, it stimulates the electrical system inside the atrial myocyte and there is a sudden increase in the amplitude from minus 90 going all the way up to 15 to 25 positive millivolts. And this is brought on by what is known as phase zero of the action potential, which is brought on by the rapid influx of sodium through the sodium channels located along the cell membrane. This is phase zero. This is followed by phase one, which is brought about by movement of potassium from inside the cell to the outside. Then we have phase two, which is maintained by continued leak of potassium outside the cell while the calcium enters the myocyte. After that, we have phase three, which is known as the repolarization, during which phase the potassium continues to leak from inside the cell to the outside until the membrane potential reaches a baseline and phase four of the action potential continues. After this action potential takes place, this stimulates the atrial myocyte, which makes it to contract. So the purpose of the electrical action potential is to bring about a mechanical change in the myocyte, and that is to make the myocyte contract. And as I said, based on the all or none phenomenon, when one atrial muscle is activated, the entire atrial chamber is activated on both sides that leads to contraction of both atria at the same time. Here are some electrolyte concentrations in the extracellular space compared to the intracellular space. And these are very important because if you are taking a board exam, they can ask you questions about which element is primarily responsible for a given phase of action potential. Now, let's say, for example, phase zero. Phase zero is primarily brought on by the extracellular potassium, which has a, which has a very high concentration moving into the intracellular space. Similarly, the potassium, which is high intracellularly, continues to leak uh, through the stages one, two, and three, thus changing the polarization of the myocyte. Another important element to remember is calcium. Calcium movement can have significant effect, not only on the action potential, but also on myocardial contractility. I talked about an action potential which has to wait for a signal to come in the atrial and ventricular musculatures. But if you look at the sinus node, the resting membrane potential is not flat. As time evolves, the resting membrane potential slowly rises and when it reaches a threshold like minus 40, it creates an action potential on its own. So the sinus node is actually not dependent on any outside stimuli to create an action potential. No doubt the sinus node may be influenced by the sympathetic or the parasympathetic system, which basically either increases or decreases the rate at which the sinus node depolarizes but nonetheless, sinus node has a spontaneous depolarization capacity because its resting membrane gradually comes up and it creates an action potential spontaneously. Whereas in, whereas in atrial and ventricular musculature, the resting membrane potential is uh, sort of 
constant unless it does not receive any stimulus then the resting membrane potential may change to a point where it will generate an action potential. The sinus node has an intrinsic rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. As long as the sinus node is beating at a rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute, it suppresses the spontaneous activation of the rest of the myocardial structures. If the sinus node fails to activate, then the AV node takes over and the AV nodal rate is 40 to 60 beats per minute. Similarly, if the AV node is not able to generate an impulse, the, inter the idioventricular rhythm appears, which is arising from the ventricles. It beats at a rate of 30 to 40 beats per minute. Now let's look at a normal cardiac cycle. We talked about the sinus node, activation of the atrium, delay in the AV node and activation of the ventricles. I didn't talk about what happens after the ventricle is depolarized. Now we're going to put not only the depolarization of the atria and ventricles, but also combine that with the repolarization of the ventricles so that we have one complete cardiac cycle. The cardiac cycle begins with the activation of the atria, which results in the mechanical con contraction of the atria, which is reflected on the surface electrocardiogram with a positive deflection, which is known as the P wave. The duration of P wave is approximately three small boxes or 120 milliseconds. And this is followed by a small interval of isoelectric period. And this is the period I was talking about, which is the PR segment where there is a delay in the impulse propagation from the atria to the ventricles so that the ventricles can completely fill with the blood before they begin the depolarization. Once the impulse reaches beyond the AV node, it activates the ventricles. First, it has the activation of the septum, which produces the Q and activation of both the ventricles coming towards the electrodes creates an R wave and as the impulse travels away from the electrodes it produces an S wave. Altogether this is known as the QRS complex which is representing the ventricular depolarization. After that we have an ST segment which is an isoelectric segment followed by repolarization of the ventricle, which is reflected by a positive deflection known as the T wave. Altogether, we have a P wave, PR interval, we have a QRS complex, then we have a ST segment, then we have a T wave. And after the T wave, it again reaches the isoelectric point until the next QRS complex begins. So here we have waves and intervals and each one of these intervals are important because the PR interval from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS reflects the time it takes for the impulse to travel from the sinus node to the point just before activating the ventricles. Similarly, the, the QT interval represents uh, the ventricular depolarization and repolarization phases uh, which may have significance in certain conditions where we may see prolonged QT interval which may be associated with ventricular arrhythmias. In the previous slide we saw a classic QRS pattern. But however, in reality, the QRS pattern may vary depending upon which lead we are looking at and depending upon whether the patient has underlying cardiac uh, conditions such as uh, myocardial infarction or chamber enlargement. So based on the degree of deflection, either going negatively or positively, the QRS complexes are designated uh, with these terminologies. If Q and the S waves are equal in depth, then they are designated as QS. If you have a small Q and a tall R wave, it is re represented as small QR. And similarly, you can follow through. For example, here, 
this is a classic uh, example of a right bundle branch block where we have a small R wave followed by a deep S wave. Then after that, we have a second R which is known as the R prime. Now let's take this electrical activity and see how we can translate that into myocardial action, which is basically myocardial contraction. Initially, I talked about first the atria getting activated that produces the P wave that is followed by activation of the ventricles that produces the QRS complex and the T waves. As a result, we have two action potentials that are involved in each cardiac cycle. So when we take this surface electrocardiogram and place it along the hemodynamic or the pressure monitorings within the cardiac chambers, then it begins to make a lot of sense as to how starting with an action potential, activation of the atria and the ventricles through this electrical system, it can transform into a mechanical action resulting in contraction and pumping of the blood. Now here we have the P wave and following the P wave, we have the activation of the atria, which increases the atrial pressure and then pumps the blood into the ventricles. With the beginning of the ventricular depolarization, uh, anywhere from 60 to 80 milliseconds after that, there is mechanical contraction of the ventricle which increases the pressure in the left ventricular cavity and when it exceeds the aortic blood pressure, it starts pumping blood into the aorta until the ventricular pressure begins to come down during the repolarization phase, at which time the aortic valves close and the ventricular pressure drops until it reaches a level below that of the atrial pressure and then the ventricles begin to fill and the whole cycle continues. So this is uh, going from one action potential uh, from a sinus node. We are come all the way to see how the heart is uh, responding electrically and also mechanically. Let's talk about real electrocardiograms as we see in everyday practice at bedside. This is a typical electrocardiogram that we see in everyday practice. But we have to have a, an in-depth knowledge of what is on the paper, what is written on the paper, and some of the hidden things so that we can properly interpret these ECGs or electrocardiogram. For example, in the olden days when the paper was rolling, while recording the electrocardiogram, we used to say the paper is running at 25 millimeters per second. So the time is on the horizontal line. On the vertical line, we have what is called the calibration or telling us the voltage of this QRS complexes. Here we have 10 boxes involved, which is equal to one millivolt. So these are very important to tell us if the heart is enlarged based on the voltage of the QRS complexes. And also it can tell us about if the patient had a heart attack based on the QRS complexes. Going deeper, the graph paper is nothing more than one millimeter squares all the way across and all the way going down. Each millimeter represents uh, 40 milliseconds. Since the paper is running at 25 millimeters per second and 1000 milliseconds divided by 25 will give you 40 milliseconds per each block. After each five blocks, we have darker lines thus representing this five blocks, which is equal to 0.4 times phi, which is 200 milliseconds. Each box represents 0.1 millivolt, or the 10 boxes represent one millivolt. So this is the foundation upon which we determine the heart rate, the heart rhythm, and also the enlargement and other things. So let's see how we can get a heart rate based on the QRS complexes. If a QRS complex begins here, 
and if it covers one, two, three, four, five major boxes, so that the next impulse is coming here, then the heart rate would be 60 beats per minute because every second we have a heart rate. Whereas if it covers only four boxes, then the heart rate would be 75. If the next R comes at three boxes interval, then the heart rate is 100. Similarly, if it covers only two boxes, the heart rate is 150. And if it covers only one big box, which has five small boxes, then the heart rate will be 300. And these numbers will be very important. That is, if it's covering five boxes, which is one second, that is 60 beats per minute. If it's covering four, which is 0.8 seconds, it is 75. And so the chart goes. These will be very useful when we are dealing with bradycardia and also when we are dealing with the tachycardia. If you are dealing with supraventricular tachycardia or ventricular tachycardia and if you notice the first beat is here and the second beat is after 10 boxes, small boxes, then the heart rate is 150. If it is uh, three big boxes, the heart rate is 100. So you should be able to just look at that and determine the heart rate. However, if the heart rate is irregular in a patient with atrial fibrillation, then we have to use a different technique to find out the heart rate. Now, let's take for example here, if you look at the electrocardiograms in certain machines, it has a six second marker at the top. And if you take six seconds and measure the number of heartbeats like here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so you have eight heartbeats for six seconds. There are uh, six times 10, 60 seconds in a minute. So the heart rate is uh, eight times 10 is equal to 80 beats per minute. So this is how you determine the heart rate when you have an irregular heart rhythm in patients with atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or multifocal atrial tachycardia. Now we're going to move on to the leads and connections. A 12 lead electrocardiogram has lead one, lead two, lead three. Then we have what are called augmented leads, which just looks at the area local to that region, namely ABR, looks at from the right shoulder point of view. ABL looks at from the left shoulder and ABF looks at from the foot. Area. Then we have the chest leads which are located across the chest which we will talk about in a minute. So here is a depiction of the lead 1 which has a negative electrode connected here and a positive electrode connected here. Similarly we have lead 2 which is going down, negative electrode is here and a positive electrode. Then we have lead 3 on this side. The augmented leads, as I told you, the AVR looks at like a, like a flashlight coming from here, looking at the heart. Similarly, AVL is sitting here with a camera looking at the heart here, and AVF with a little camera and focusing from the bottom. And because we are looking like a, looking through a keyhole from different angles, they look at the way the impulse is seen from that angle, and that helps us to identify in what direction the impulses are traveling and that may shed some light on the electrical activity of the heart and also evidence of any myocardial infarctions or heart blocks. Now let's move on to the chest leads. We talked about the limb leads, the augmented leads and I talked about V1 to V6 chest leads and this is a diagram which represents how the chest leads are placed. It is exceedingly important to know how the chest leads are placed in order to get a meaningful electrocardiogram. V1 is placed in the fourth intercostal space to the right of the sternum. V2 is placed in the fourth intercostal space uh, to the left of the sternum. V3 is placed between V2 and V4 in the fourth intercostal space. Also, V4 is in the mid-clavicular line, mid-clavicular line. Then the remaining leads are placed in the fifth intercostal space. V4 is placed here. V3 
5 is placed in the anterior axillary line and V6 in the mid axillary line in the fifth intercostal spaces. Why are the positions of these electrodes important? Because if you have a patient with a big breast, it is not uncommon for technicians to place these leads in the second intercostal space where all the impulses are going down. As a result, we can get negative complexes in the chest leads, giving an impression that this patient had either myocardial infarction or chronic lung disease. So in those patients, it is important to make sure these leads are placed uh, below the breast if it's necessary until we can get good what is called R-wave progression through the chest leads. So these leads are placed in close proximity to the myocardium. As a result, they reflect the electrical activities in that area. And so V1 and V2 represent the right ventricle. V3 and V4 represent the anterior wall of the left ventricle, whereas V5 and V6 represent the electrical activity of the lateral wall of the left ventricle. Okay, after almost 35 minutes, we are coming to a normal electrocardiogram. We talked about lead one, two, three, and the augmented leads, which look at from one particular focus point. Then we had the chest leads, which look at in close proximity to the area they are located. Normally in lead one, the P waves are upright and the QRS complexes are upright and the T waves are upright and the ST segment is uh, the same level as the TP segment and the PR segments. If this ST segment deviates, then we talk about ST depression or ST elevation, which will be covered in the future chapters. Since the rate here is approximately, if it was falling right here on three big boxes, the rate would have been 100. And since it is a little slower than 100, you can say like 93, since it is falling on the next smaller box. So that is how you find out the rate. If the QRS complexes are occurring at a constant rate, then we say the rhythm is normal. And we saw in the previous electrocardiogram with the atrial fibrillation, where the RR intervals were irregular, that was due to atrial fibrillation with variable ventricular response. Similarly, in lead two, the P, QRS and T waves are upright. In lead three, the P waves are generally upright, they can be inverted, and the T waves are generally inverted in uh, lead three, or they could be upright or flat. So in other words, the T waves can be variable in lead three. In ABR, since all the impulses are going from the right shoulder farther away, the P deflection will be negative. Similarly, the QRS deflection will be negative and the T wave also will be negative. So this is a characteristic of uh, AVR. When you look at from the right shoulder, you see all the impulses going from the sinus node to the atria to the ventricles. Uh, they are all moving away from that uh, focal point and we see the negative deflections. Since the impulses go from the right to the left, the AVL produces an electrocardiogram which is very similar to the lead one. And since the impulses are coming down and to the left, AVF also produces positive deflections. Now let's talk about the chest leads as these are called that is V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. V1 and V2, I told you, represents most likely the right ventricular electrical activity. Generally, the P waves are biphasic in V1 or, or negative based on where the lead is placed. The positive deflection is caused by the right atrial activation and the negative deflection is caused by the left atrial activation. Since the impulses move from the right to the left, we see a negative deflection in V1 with a positive T wave or a negative T wave. All of these are normal findings in V1. In V2, we can occasionally see negative T waves because I said this may also be representing the right ventricle. 
or we can see like here, which is normal. By the time we reach V3, the R waves should be more prominent and the S waves should be less prominent. And this is what I called earlier natural or normal R wave progression. By the time you get to V4, 5, 6, they all have positive deflections, which is uh, the tall R waves with upright P waves and positive T waves. So this is a normal electrocardiogram. I talked about some of the minor variations we see in lead three, where the T waves may be inverted, in AVR, where everything is inverted, and in V1 and V2, where the P waves can be negative. We have a QS complex, RS complex, and also sometimes inversion of the T waves. Let's keep that in mind. Okay, let's move on to some poor EKG technique flags. If you see muscle tremors on the electrocardiogram or you see a 60 cycle artifact, if you see 60 cycle artifacts, remove the cord from the outlet. Uh, since most of these have battery backup, uh, try to record them and make sure you have good contact with the skin when the electrodes are attached. Bonding baseline. If a patient is moving or if the cables are moving, we're going to get wandering baseline. Every precaution should be taken to make sure that the electrocardiogram you take is uh, picture perfect. Loss of R waves in all the precordial leads. I just uh, touched upon this while talking about the chest leads. If you record, if you place the leads high up in the second space or the third space, you could lose R waves in the entire precordial leads from V1 to V6. If that happens, you should go back and repeat the electrocardiogram by placing these electrodes below the breast level or in the fifth or even the sixth intercostal space in some patients to make sure that you may have a natural R wave progression in the chest leads. When we see negative deflections in lead one or all positive deflections in AVR, that should be a red tag because this may represent lead misplacement. Similarly, if R waves are flying off the graph, then we need to change the calibration to half standard. Because if you have a patient with significant ventricular hypertrophy, if the R waves are going way past the graph markings, we may not be able to measure the R wave amplitude. In those cases, you have to use half calibration to make sure that the R waves are captured properly. Blaming the patient is not going to make the electrocardiogram look better. And blaming the situation, saying it is an emergency, that's fine. Come back when things are settled, repeat the electrocardiogram, get a good tracing, because that good tracing is a reflection of you and your performance as a technician. Don't blame the EKG machine. You have to work with what you have and try to make the best. If that doesn't work, try a different technician. Let's talk about the adrenergic system. When I talked about the sinus node, I said the sinus node can spontaneously depolarize and activate the entire heart on its own. The, to a certain degree, yes, but I, we have to understand that the sinus node is controlled by this sympathetic system, which uh, through the medullary cardiopulmonary centers and through the pre-ganglionic fibers, they reach the ganglia and from there we have the post-ganglionic uh, fibers uh, going to the sinus node and controlling the heart rate. The sympathetic system has uh, a number of effects on the heart. Uh, we talk about, we'll talk about that in a minute. And similarly, the parasympathetic system, which sort of uh, opposes the actions of the sympathetic system, and that can also have a seesaw effect on the heart in trying to fine tune the heart's function based on the metabolic needs on a second to second basis. It is like a pilot trying to lift the left wing a little bit or the right wing a little bit so that the plane is maintained in a proper balance. Similarly, a little discharge from the sympathetic or a counteraction from the parasympathetic can constantly regulate the heart rate and cardiovascular functions in such intricate manner. If we were to recreate that, it may cost a fortune.
to what this simple neuronal and hormonal systems can do on their own. Let's look at some of the adrenergic cardiovascular responses. The sympathetic system, by stimulating the heart, can increase the heart rate, which is known as the chronotropic response. You need to remember the word chronotropic response, which refers to the heart rate. In contrast to that, it can also increase the contractility of the myocardium, and this is known as the inotropic response. Further down, we will learn about the drugs that can affect the heart rate, which are known as chronotropic agents. Then we have drugs which can affect the contractility of the ventricle, which are known as the inotropic agents. It can also accelerate cardiac relaxation. That's an important function, which you rarely ever see anywhere in most books. This is called the Lucy Trophy. The next one is enhanced AV conduction. The sympathetic system increases the conduction through the AV node, which is known as the dromotropic effect. That's what happens in when patients are excited or when they are having fever or anemia, there is acceleration of the conduction through the AB node. As a result, the heart rate goes up. When somebody is in the intensive care unit with a high fever or anxiety, their heart rate goes up. And that is due to the increased adrenergic response, which enhances AB conduction. Similarly, the adrenergic system can also decrease the venous capacitance. That is, in a fight or flight situation, the adrenergic system acts as the, the fight response. It increases the heart rate, it increases the contractility, it increases the AV conduction, it constricts the veins by increasing the blood return to the heart, and it also constricts the cutaneous vessels to conserve the cardiac output to the most important organs during a fight response. On the contrary, the parasympathetic system counteracts the sympathetic effects on the cardiovascular system. The parasympathetic system acts through the vagal nerve and it discharges acetylcholine, uh, which can significantly slow the conduction through the AB node. So the parasympathetic system acts predominantly on the AB node of the heart in addition, it also causes significant vasodilatation in the extremities and splanchnic area, which leads to pooling of the blood in the lower extremities and in the splanchnic area. That leads to reduction in the heart rate, drop in blood pressure, which results in uh, dizziness and syncope. This is what is called neurogenic syncope. When there is an extreme parasympathetic stimulation, when there is a vagal attack, which we commonly call it, uh, there is excess acetylcholine release into the circulation, which affects the AB node and also the blood vessels in the splanchnic and extremity levels, uh, causing blood pooling, decrease in heart rate, vasodilatation, leading to dizziness and syncope. Now we're going to conclude with the electrical axis of the heart. A lot of importance is paid to the electrical axis of the heart, but not a whole lot we can do based on the electrical axis because we won't be able to change the electrical axis, but it does give us a lot of information about uh, various types of conditions such as bundle branch blocks or hypertrophy. The electrical axis of the heart is a reflection of how the impulse is traveling through the heart in the chest. AB node is considered as the center of this point and as the impulse travels, fr travels from the sinus node to the AB node and goes through the ventricles, so we expect the general direction of the impulse to be in this fashion. And when you move that from this center, the normal axis is between minus 30 and plus 90 degrees from AVL to AVF. As a result, your lead one, your normal axis is from minus 30 to 90. However, if there is enlargement on the right side of the heart, if the impulse is traveling towards the right, 
then we may get a right axis deviation. On the other hand, if there is a block in one of the conduction system and the impulse is going to the left and up, then we may see a left axis deviation. Let's see how we can translate this into real bedside situation. Now here we have a superimposition of these uh, electrodes uh, on this circle which we were looking at before. We, talk, we said the normal axis is between uh, minus 30 and 90 degrees and here is our lead one which is located in the middle here and here is the negative, here's the negative electrode and the positive electrode for lead one and here we have the AVL and here is our AVR and then we have AVF which is here lead 2 here 60 degrees and lead 3 120 degrees. So if the electrical impulse is positive in lead 1 and is negative in AVF that means it has to be in this quadrant somewhere between minus 0 and minus 90. On the other hand if a lead 1 is positive and AVF or lead 2 or positive, the impulse has to be somewhere between 0 and 90 degrees. Similarly, if we have an impulse which is uh, positive in AVR and positive in lead 3 or AVF, then the impulse has to be somewhere along this region which accounts for the right axis deviation. So, the way to find out is find out a lead which is equiphasic, which is the, the positive deflection and the negative deflection are equal. That means it is zero. So if the, let's take for example lead two, if the positive and negative deflections are zero, then it must be perpendicular to a lead which is minus 30 AVL. So the axis is somewhere around 30. When the axis is somewhere around 30, the AVL will be equiphasic. That's one way to find out uh, about the electrical axis of the heart. Now let's look at some examples. Now here we have lead 1, lead 2, lead 3, AVR, AVL, AVF. Let's use this graph here. Lead 1 is positive, so it's got to be in this half of the semicircle. Lead 2 is more negative than positive. So lead 2 is more negative than positive. So if lead 2 is more negative, then the impulse should be opposite to this. To add to that, if we see the impulse is negative in lead 3, so this is negative in lead 3, this is negative in lead AVF, that means all of this are telling that impulse is going towards this region. If, if it is equiphasic, then it would have been minus 30. Since this is more negative than positive, the axis is between minus 30 and minus 90, somewhere between 45, which is called the left axis deviation. And it may also be caused by left ventricular hemi block. Now let's look at another scenario. Now we have a negative net negative deflection in one. That means it is positive here, it is negative, so it has to be in this quadrant. Now let's fine tune this one. So we have three and AVF are positive, three and AVF are positive, so it is in this quadrant and it has got to be somewhere here. And AVR is equiphasic, so that means it has to be AVR is plus minus equals zero, it's got to be perpendicular to that. That is 120 degrees, which is right axis deviation. So that is how we can find out the electrical axis. There's one more simpler way, and that is the quadrantic method of a finding. That is, we just look at two leads, for example, lead one and AVF. If lead one is positive, lead AVS is positive, we have a normal axis, positive. On the other hand, if lead one is a positive and AVF is negative, then we have a left axis deviation. Similarly, if lead one is negative, then we are talking about right axis deviation. When all these uh, leads are sort of uh, have equiphasic uh, distribution like we see in this electrocardiogram, this is called the indeterminate axis. So ladies and gentlemen, 
what is your diagnosis on this electrocardiogram. Write it down. When we come back, we'll look at it. That concludes the presentation on clinical EKG interpretation, introduction, and please take a look at our clinical EKG interpretation on Amazon, and we will see you with the next presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.